All right, welcome everyone. This is the Meaningful Movement podcast. I'm Seth Dellinger and I'm here with Lewis Cook today. Really excited about this conversation. Lewis Cook is a multidisciplinary artist and the creator of a really unique movement practice called Relax to Erupt, um, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about. I wanna say right at the beginning, if you don't know Lewis already, um, we'll see what happens when the podcast comes out, whether we include it in, the, in this reel or, or we just put some links, but you need to actually see Lewis move, I think, to mm -hmm. fully appreciate the conversation we're gonna have because um, I'll just say to you, Lewis, um, I found found you on Instagram, right? As as the way the world works these days, and um, yeah. being a movement person myself, um, the algorithms out there they know to show me bizarre movements and acrobatic movement. So there's a lot of incredible movers I see out there, um, but I have to say with you, I think you have an incredible imagination also, which is what really drew me to to want to talk to you. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and um, maybe the place to start is just to ask you to tell people what is Relax to Erupt? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I feel like it's something that's shifting all the time for me. Um, uh, relax to Erupt to stem from many different things, uh, many different styles, let's say, of movement. Um, my foundation and what I've studied in most is dance, uh, in contemporary dance. However, I have dabbled into many different styles just to try it. Uh, don't mock it unless you've tried it, this sort of uh, approach to movement I have. So maybe that would be a little bit of breaking, maybe that'd be a little bit of tumbling, a little bit of sort of, let's say, gymnastics, maybe some elements of capoeira, um, ballet, I've tried tap dancing, I've tried modern, I've tried pretty much uh, Irish dancing, ballroom, Latin, I've, I've tried loads. And maybe some of these things you'll recognize in, in videos or within Relaxed Erupt. Um, but the idea of Relaxed Erupt is sort of just make a montage of my, my dance training and vocabulary that I've learned, as well as sort of my more physical sport background. Um, I studied boxing for about 10 years. My dad's a boxing coach and uh, it was always on and off. And I was told at first when starting dancing, uh that perhaps at some moments oh you're too stiff to to do this or you know you're too blocked here you're too muscle bound um however then from having that sort of muscular uh, buoyancy that sort of uh energy that i brought then it would allow me to do other things that perhaps weren't des designated in that class but then it would allow me to do this trick or or this sort of transition so I started to realize when, when, when training and when studying that actually I want to create something which stems from my own sort of interest, my own personal interest and, and something that will benefit my body rather than just having this like one suit fits all. Um, so yeah, Relax to Erupt uh, is, is similar with the name. Um, we, we play a lot with energy and with intention within the body. Uh, we look at sometimes going, you know, to this 100% phase where we're really trying to exhaust ourselves and really push the movement to the max. And we also look at how we can sort of just enter in and out of, let's say, simple things like handstands or, or even jumps and how we can go with this real ease approach and trying to get rid of sort of associate tension in the body. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a real broad structure of relaxed yeah. erupt. <laughs> well, one of the things that I've seen you say in a couple places uh, is that you emphasize that it's not a technique. You say this is a practice. And, you know, yeah. I mean, the point of this podcast is to invite different guests who have different movement practice of different kinds, because one of the things that I find as a movement teacher, um, I'm, I'm a teacher of the Feldenkrais method, and I'm kind of developing my own style with that. But um, it kind of speaks to what you were saying, where if, if you get really good at one thing, it almost disqualifies you for the other, you know, so the ability to, um, you know, which, which doesn't mean we all have to know how to do everything, but, but a practice to me is something where I'm developing myself as opposed to the technique. And, you know, uh, there are a lot of people out there who create movement programs and they call them techniques, but you, you apparently were very intentional about calling it a practice. 
Yeah, uh, it was actually a discussion I had once um, when teaching in, I was teaching in Canada and it was something I, I was talking to some of the students about. And I think also it's just the way you look at the, the two words within technique or within practice. I think actually when we searched online, they actually have the same the same values, you know, not one isn't fixed. It's just a, yeah, it's a technique just like we see a practice. But I think the way that I view the two words are very different. I view a technique as in it's very set and it's structured and there's not so much room for leeway. But then a practice I see as something that's constantly evolving and you have this, uh, you have this confidence to go wrong, uh, you know, and, and to, to perhaps look stupid or be stupid. Um, and, and this is a, a huge fundamental to sort of my work and to staying curious. Yeah, I mean, if I just think about where does practice fit into my life, like when I was a kid, I went to soccer practice. Mm -hmm. What was that about? It was like, well, we go twice a week because we're trying to get better. We're practicing. And yet the game of soccer, you never know where the ball is going to go. You never know what the opportunity is going to be or what the opponent will do. So there's this, there's this completely open-ended um, possibility. And yet there's a way that, you know, you come to the practice and you practice passing and you practice shooting and you practice seeing what's going on in the field. So there's some sort of, would you say with relaxed to erupt because you do draw on so many things. Um, are there certain principles though that you keep coming back to that you keep emphasizing with people? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think also, you know, structure is also super important. It's not like it's always going to be free and we do a bit of this, bit of that, because then also you don't really get anything in depth. You know, you don't get the sort of full understanding of something. Uh, I think it's just trying to find the things that are intrinsically motivating for you you know you do it for your own personal reward you know you're not going to get a reward from someone else you do it because you're fascinated within that um so to me the things that always come back is having this um success to failure sort of ratio we always aim to i i say at the beginning of every class we aim to have 60 to 70 percent um success and then 40 to 30 percent failure so we're always on that just reaching but not quite getting there sort of stage and if we feel like we keep reaching we keep getting there then great but we have that in the body already so now rather than just going through what's comfortable and what we know and not learning anymore we then say okay how can we try it like this like that um it was something that uh i'm part of a movement collective called Firis anima terra nova and it was something the guy that created it called thomas love english it was something that he said to me uh, during one of their his workshops and it really, really stuck with me. And he was using me for an example for an exercise. And he said, Lewis is like a, a, a monkey see monkey do, you know, and he said it, it, you know, in this way. And it is funny and it is, it is, it is this, it is just this compliment, uh, this comment, whether it's a compliment or not, I don't know. But for me, this is very much like my values. You know, I see something and I'm like, okay, and how can I make that my own? How can I adapt that? How can I shift it like this? How can I do it in reverse? And, and there's just, you know, that's sort of where my imagination sort of thrives within that element. So it's very much something that I like in Relax to Erupt. It's a principle that if I, if I teach something multiple times and already from there, how can I then adapt it, evolve it, move on from it? Perhaps I scrap that and during the next class you come to, and it might be a little bit more boxing orientated because that's my background and that's what I want to share. So that's why I don't just say it's for dancers and I try to keep it open to just those that are movement, movement in enthusiasts, you know, and perhaps different workshops will be for different levels um but those two things are, are, are super important within it i guess the third thing which also ties in with that is having this childlike curiosity and just having this curiosity that perhaps an exercise might not be for you right now or perhaps you already know it perhaps you've come 10 times during that same week and you know it of course i'm having to keep some sort of consistency so how within that can you explore for yourself so then it's also, you can come to my class once, you can come 50 times and we can still continually grow together as well as me as a teacher and an artist and as well as you as the, as the student because that's what I aim to be, the student uh, constantly. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, this, is, this is a topic I often come back to on the podcast because um, 
let's just say because of the time period we live in, um, there's so many opportunities out there. There's so many, you, you mentioned many different forms of movement you explored. And I imagine, you know, for someone to do that the way you have is, is probably more common these days than it used to be just because of the internet and whatever, that there's more offerings out there. Um, but there, there's also this student teacher relationship that happens. And like one of the things that can happen if we try many different things is like, wow, that, what you just told me that's really brilliant, but it seems to kind of contradict what my last teacher told me. And how do I work this out and still feel good and maybe not feel any animosity between what, what this person told me and that person. And so there's a kind of, there's a way we have to involve ourselves. Um, the, the monkey see monkey do thing struck me because the idea is simple, you know, like you see and you repeat, but it strikes me that, um, like you, you said something about simple things like handstands, but of course, for many yeah. people, that doesn't seem so simple. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I've played with handstand a bit and, um, you know, I'm, I'm no person who's going to put my Instagram post, but, but part yeah. of it is, in, you know, there's all kinds of like, do I have the strength? Am I, am I aligned correctly? But there's a lot about like, how willing am I am, am I to fail as you, as you yeah. say and so to repeat something that I saw someone else do that I never tried, part of it is like, how much do I really attempt to do what I just saw versus like, no, oh, I, I can only sort of partially. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is such a inhibiting factor, you know, where when it comes to when it comes to movement as a whole, I think like I kind of briefly mentioned, but, you know, I think often, and as you've mentioned, often we're told that, okay, now you're in this class, or perhaps now you're yeah in this sport now you should do it like this and i and i really see the the benefits of that you know if you if you're gonna be a boxer then yeah it is great that you have your shoulders up here you know you keep your elbows in you're protected and that you know one to side uh, chin to one side and you have this sort of defensive mechanism but if i if i dance like this also then I, you know it's it's a, it's a style it's a way of moving but then also i become very stiff and very blocked so i think i in some degree learn it the hard way but i think also perhaps the best way that you i'm such a committed sort of enthusiastic person that when i did these things i really committed 100 percent um and actually what i realized is that's okay and actually part of my practice is to be adaptable so for the uh for well actually not for the past month but before that for about nine weeks i was on a really sort of consistent ring program and i never felt such sort of healthy shoulders and the stability in my handstands was really growing the comfort of being sort of inverted in my in my shoulders and in my back was was really there but then it meant when it came to other things oh wow i could really feel the difference and even then jumping back to boxing and thinking that that might be good i felt the heaviness again throwing the punches and i wasn't so light and and it, it, this is sort of how i like to see a practice is it needs to be something that constantly keeps evolving um because you have to adapt to your body also, you know, and, uh, and as we age to have this adaptability, I think is, is, is crucial. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so you said a few things that, that I want to pick up on there. You talked about, you know, kind of going a hundred percent at something, but you also said that in your uh, development, you learned the hard way, right. And then you just mentioned now, what happens as we age. So it would seem to me underneath the surface is the question of, okay, this all looks exciting and acrobatic and fun, but what about injury? Like how, how, do, you, how do you explore in safety, including things that, you know, I've never done that before and I want yeah. to do that, but, but how do you approach those kinds of situations? Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh... I think that's also where the idea of also group, you know, group training and, and also studying under those that have studied that comes in. Um, because even though I have this really open and really explorative uh, approach and interest, you know, like you said, if you've never gone on your hands before, then just to say to go up onto a handstand is, is very difficult already. That's a very, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very scary jump. Um, and I think the, the the key things that help with that is, is, is briefly what I mentioned anyway with um 
in regards to sort of don't be afraid to to look stupid um i think this sort of block in our minds and this idea of like if i fall i fail is um is is yeah is a is a massive barrier and a massive block and i think especially with movement you throw me into any movement context and i am very comfortable i would say and it doesn't matter what um what style I, now i have a real great understanding of my body that i will just throw myself and i will and i i know my body will adapt i have the sort of these instant reflexes where it will do it um did you did you experience injury along the way did so I, i've only i've only injury? really ever had one injury um it was actually last year um and it was i was getting sort of um the wrong diagnosis at first it was told that it was a um what was it uh, i had a sort of like um oh, what did they say they said it was a in i thought my intestine was inflamed or something they were saying to me at first um uh it actually just happened when i was teaching a workshop in in belgium and my my back just gave way it felt like my spine it just sort of disconnected and dropped and it was only when i was stood at the side so it was one of them i was just doing some what? wild i wasn't doing anything i just stood up <laughs> okay. at the side and then suddenly my back was like ah, okay like what is this um uh and yeah and then i went to see a, an amazing well what i was told is a, an amazing osteo there and he told me it was an inflamed intestine just sort of watch what you eat be careful of your diet and things like this and, and just come back to me here's a few exercises so i did and, and i took a, a time off from the company i was working with then the company that i also work with in belgium called anton lashke company is a very very physical company um they look a lot that they have again they have a fascinating sort of look into movement uh anton uh, the, the guy that created it uh, has a fascinating way it's called puzzle work um and it looks at speed and coordination uh, essentially and done to the maximum so when you think you're at your quickest then you come back the next day and you go quicker and when you think you're there you and then once you once you're there you then add more complexity and you add more pieces to the puzzle so if you think your arms can only come up this way and you think you're doing enough well, actually that's only one body part moving so then you try to like move your head at the same time and then he's like okay but what's your body doing and then it, it just goes like this and you just break it down you know section by section and you go through and you add to the complexity so i was in a show like this um and then i went back to rehearsals with him and uh we thought i sort of had the all clear i was doing everything i uh, doing the exercises and then suddenly during a rehearsal um I felt something go again in my back, uh, this time during movement. And the adrenaline kept me going for quite a while. We got to the end of the phrase and then we were going to show a separate section because it was in front of some programmers. And then I, within about 30 seconds, it went from like, he was like, okay, are you good to do this? And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to like mark it. And he was like, you tell me, you know, if you need to stop or anything. So I said, so we went to market and I did the first move and I thought, oh, I actually can't move. <laughs> it was a really, I literally, like it just, like I said, the, the, it just rapidly decreased, you know, my, 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 my confidence for my body then. Uh -huh. um, and then, yeah, within the span of like 15 minutes, I, I kept it getting like the odd sort of, now I sort of know more nerves kicking in and pulling in my spine. Right. Um, so then it, made me really like lean over and then I had to lean on my friends. Um, and I said to them, I feel a bit sick as well. I don't, I don't feel too good. And, and I did actually, and I passed out and I've never had an injury before. And I think also this was a, I wasn't, I've never been in that frame of mind before. I've never been in that state of panic. Um, did, that, uh, did that change your, because, you know, when I asked the question again, you know, if people take a look at your videos, they'll see you running, um, in different directions, you know, rolling, jumping, you even will flip. Uh, you clearly have acrobatic training and whatnot. Um, but the question kind of came from like, you know, there's a lot of chances for something to go wrong. And you did have something kind of go wrong, but it wasn't like, oh, uh, Lewis, you, you really shouldn't have pushed yourself that hard to try to do that much acrobatics because it was you were bound to lose your balance and crash to the ground at some point. It doesn't sound yeah. like that happened. Um, yeah. Yet you were sort of taken out for a while. I mean, did, did you find that your approach coming out of that and healing that you, 
you changed somehow? Yeah, de that? definitely. I think actually, I think, um, I think it's really important that everyone goes through actually an injury at some point. It doesn't matter how little or how big. I think it it teaches you a lot, and also it shows that then you're sort of you know you're at this boundary stage where you're constantly reaching and maybe not quite attaining and then the next time you're getting and then the next time you need to push further um and I think that's something I'd always done and there'd always been tiny niggles and never really anything major because I also value you know so much my warm-up my cool down my rehabilitation the way I look after myself the the yeah everything you know I really try to look into everything in regards to movement to keep myself as fit for as long as possible you know and and as mobile and as agile for as long as possible um i think that the 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 nice benefit of that is it's also my job you know it's also what i do being you know multidisciplinary movement artist i need to look after myself also on that downtime um rather than that i just dance let's say nine to five and then i go and i do whatever you know that Sadly, that's not the, the job, life I live, but also that's what I love about it. You know, I love the fact that that isn't that and, and my life evolves around movement. Um, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, well, we were talking a bit about just injury and exploration and how to make that safe, but also how to not inhibit yourself, I guess. I mean, the word we didn't say before, but uh, would probably be fear, right? Like with the handstand, it's it's not just the mechanics, it's the fear, right? That you have to overcome. Um, may, may, one of the things that I see, and, and I think you, you wrote about the floor in particular with Relax to Erupt. Um, and I don't know, you, you probably know there's a dancer out there by the name of David Zambrano. He has a technique called flying low, which I just know about because I... Um, Years ago, I had a, a group here in DC, it was called Movement Research. And one of um, my main collaborators, um, and this is another connection I know for you, um, is that I had met her at a fighting monkey workshop. Mm -hmm. So I've seen you with the fighting monkey shirt on in some of your videos. <laughs> you must be aware of, you know, they're just wild like games and different yeah. movement strategies. Um, but, but, what I under, and, and I, I don't know a lot about Zambrano, but what I understood from my friend is he was helping people kind of go into the floor, almost like, like the way we go into water when we dive into a swimming pool. It's like, it's not necessarily a hard stop and you, but if you soften in the right place, there's a way of sort of undulating into the floor. And I, you know, I, I'm sure yeah. that any, anyway, I, I, I don't, I don't, mean to compare you with Zambrano because I don't even know enough about him, but it, it seems that when I watch you, one of the things that you don't appear to be afraid of is landing really on any particular part of your body. Um, it's like we're all used to walking and we know the ground with the soles of our feet, or maybe we even roll and we know um, our back against the floor, but even to go up the upper arm or even the side of the neck could potentially, if we if we do know how to take care of ourselves, there's many parts of the body that could support our weight. Yeah. This, this is what I see when I'm watching you, but um, how do you think about the floor and movement? And yeah, I mean, floor? yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, great point. There's so many things that sort of came to mind. I mean, David Zambrano also, yeah, for those that don't know, really need to check that out. Uh, he has a technique called flying low and passing through. Um, uh and yeah he's i think he maybe he's 65 or so and he's still very much active and still very much diving into the floor diving up teaching workshops all over the world um and again it just goes to show sort of having this practice that he has and and is really helped to change him he also has a fascinating story on how it began i believe it began from a serious injury again so he had to realize what it was like to go down uh, into the floor and out the floor. So this taught him a lot too. And again, which is why I think it's something he can share with so much detail because he really understands what it was like to not have it and to really try to build up through some foundations to then this level, then this level, then be able to teach it and then to still learn from your teaching it. Um, so yeah, that, I guess that's that's on him. The, I've always had a fascination with floor work. Uh, I've loved it. I, I worked in a company called National Youth Dance Company when I was younger. And I worked with Yasmin Vardman and Akram Khan. 
uh, both these uh, established choreographers of uh, uh, have beautiful intricate floor work um, let's say um, again very physical um, so that just sparked that sort of fire in me very very young um, and I noticed them when studying and when trying to create this thing that is relaxed to erupt now um, floor work is a big part of the way I move and 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 how I express myself let's say um, uh, and then I started to use sort of let's say some understandings that I learned from them and then also again reflecting back to Fierus Anima Terra Nova uh, the movement collective that I'm a part of uh, is this idea of associated tension and then also how can I relate this associated tension into the floor work so like uh, I always tend to share specific movements within the class within my classes which really share it uh, I think to the to the best of its ability but um for for example like animalistic movement you know and and how you'll see how animals you know move they don't go block block hands feet you know it's kind of always isolated and then it means that if one starts to fall this other one's here and then I can use it to catch or protect myself so within floor work then I started to notice that we have a great tendency to go down with the feet. And, and of course, this is the most practical way, hands and feet, you know, there's no denying it. And this is what Flying Low does incredible and, and many other techniques is they understand the most fundamental way to sort of enter in and out. But then also I, I started to be a little bit inspired, let's say from, from breaking and from my own sort of uh, exploration of, okay, if I can go down always on, on my bum or my hands and my feet, how else can I enter the floor? Uh, I know my, you know, my knees bend this way, but then actually how can I maybe keep them straight and use the ripple through my legs and maybe through my spine. So then I started to explore, okay, how do I go down on my shoulders, my arms, my elbows and, and I, I am not at a level that a breaker is I'm probably not at a level that a capoeirist is I'm not, at, you know, many levels within these disciplines, but I found something here that I can translate and share to those that are fascinated in movement and would like to further develop their own personal practice. Mm -hmm. So that for me is a, that, that for me is why I teach relax to erupt and not, you know, this dance class or this technique, right. um, because it's an approach and it's a, it's a, and a way, a way of moving, which I feel like now I've established and I would like to continually develop. So in the meantime, it's called Relax to Erupt, but we'll see maybe in five years time, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different name. Yeah, um, I, I, I probably should have asked you earlier just because it's kind of the framework of how I think about things. Are, do, you, do you know of the, uh, uh, the Feldenkrais method, awareness through movement classes and whatnot? Yeah, I do. I've really not studied, studied so much Feldenkrais at all, um, right. but I read a book, um, not so long ago i can't remember which one it was i think it, might be, it was the brain's way of healing oh I'm sure really, yeah yeah uh, by norman Deutsch. He referenced that. That. yes exactly right. this one right uh, he referenced it a lot and and i've known of it and i know a, a couple of my friends are feldenkrais practitioners right um, oh and again, i think there's lots of yeah there's lots of things right. in there that will relate into mine as well well so again that that's why i bring it up because there's many um concepts um that that I use in my work that come from Feldenkrais, but again, I just I just sort of feel like I'm seeing them when I'm watching you move. Um, I've been putting together, and and I mean a lot of them are not so much mine, but I'm trying to put them into a language because Feldenkrais was this guy who just was sort of very idiosyncratic, who was a genius in some ways, but he was also you know like pure human, you know, with all his flaws, and he just did a lot of stuff, left a lot of work behind, but it wasn't necessarily so systematized and organized. Um, but he really came back to certain things, which I think of principles. Uh, I think of them as principles. And so one of the principles, and this is also just my way of trying to get back to what you're doing, but what I see you doing is there's a principle of reversibility. And that is that I mean, okay, if you dive into the floor, you've committed and there's going to be momentum. But if I'm walking, I'm not stuck continuing in this direction. Like I have the capacity at any moment to stop and reverse or change direction. So it's like I'm committed to the action, but I'm inside the action. I'm open and available for a different action that I might want to begin at any point 
while I abandon this one. And I, I feel like I'm seeing you do that because there's, there's movements that you'll initiate that as the, I guess the audience, I could say, as I'm, I'm watching the video, it's like my mind projects that, oh, well, he's gonna end up over there, but then you change, right? Mm -hmm. And because, because there's a certain, um, I wouldn't say it's easy to roll quickly in one direction and keep the momentum, but, but there's a certain simplicity to the, okay, I'm just gonna go in this line as opposed to like, I could suddenly veer off somewhere. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think this is, yeah, this is also something that I am fascinated in, you know, where you, you think you can predict what's going to happen next and, oh, and suddenly this happens. Um, and uh, I think this is why I always encourage people if they're asking about my, my classes, my workshops, some people are worried about the level. If I'm doing a professional or open level class, I would recommend anyone that has that fascination to, to you know, within movement to come because of course, I'm not going to teach the first exercise that we learn this flip or this throw or this, you know, and I think often that's what sometimes can be misjudged by, via media. I share a lot of my training and my research, but that is a relaxed up to where I have it now. And that isn't going to be where a beginner will just jump straight in. And I think that's what I love about teaching is it, it, it teaches you, you know, as you're teaching, you're the student and you can learn from it. So the more and more ages and abilities that I teach and I have taught, then the, the better foundations I can create and which will help to prevent injury, but also to then help, you know, to build your understanding of relaxed to erupt. Um, yeah, I, I guess also on that note, you know, I, I didn't jump straight out when I thought I had something that was called relaxed to erupt, but I wanted to teach to professionals. I thought I actually know what I want to do is I want to teach it to younger people at first. So there were people like, you know, 13 plus and and I was figuring out then from going into schools okay what is it that I that I want to share with them and, and maybe for them it's more just this idea of openness and curiosity and, that, and approaching right. that movement so they don't have to think they have to look like this so it has to look like that and that's right and that's wrong and perhaps it's all accepted but now we're just working on this you know and we can shift through um and that, that really taught me a lot. And again, you know, in regards to foundations, then that, that, that shared with me a lot because there's lots of things I could not share in that, in that environment. It was, it was, it's too much. Um, uh, I think that also comes from me being, uh, I, I first started teaching like an all boys sort of dance company when I was about 13. Uh, I was just like a few years older than them. That was in the in the group but at the school I was in. They they asked because uh, they created they had an older let's say boys dance company which I was sort of in and more the leader of, and they wanted to then create a a younger junior company. So then the gap wasn't so big. So they asked me who was in that to then create that. So I think even from then my 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 interest and and passion for teaching begun. Um, uh yeah so i've taught people from 13 to again you know let's say 60 plus where it's adult levels of, in london classes where it's level one level two and that can be you know really any any level or whether it's professional classes or international touring where you know i teach i would regard some of the highest or or at least some of the most open physical movers there are um so so yeah to me that's a that's been a big fascination um, okay, so I probably could keep going asking you about your practice, um, but mm -hmm. I'll just change gears a little bit. And um, I'm sorry, I can't remember where I saw this, but um, I, I've watched a lot of clips and, and some of the companies that you mentioned that you work with. Um, uh, Latchkey, what was it? Ant Anton Latchkey? Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, that was, that was some incredible stuff. And then uh, but somewhere I saw that you had created a solo performance and the theme was around mental illness. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to call back what I saw, but I feel like I saw a clip that was that. But in any case, um, there was this, I've seen you move in a way where I could imagine very well that you're expressing someone who's almost like I'm in my body, but I'm trying to get out or something, some kind of, um, 
anyway, so so that's that's one thing I know has been a theme for you. But even to make it broader, I'm just curious. Um, we've been talking a lot about how how do you move one's body and how do you move your body and become comfortable doing new things. But on the on the other side is is expression, right? And is um, so I'm curious, you know, in terms of what do you think about in terms of what you're trying to say as you move? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and this is something that's forever changing. And, and actually that's what I love about movement. Um, uh, I think sometimes you can find this honest, pure state within improvisation where you, you, you know, you're just being you, you're just doing you, perhaps to some exaggerated level in terms of moving the limbs or perhaps also not. And perhaps there's also times in the studio where I improvise and I just be, and I'm very quiet and I'm very calm and, and, th and that's the place that I'm in. Um, I think, yeah, I think that is something that's forever changing. Um, I am naturally a, a high, highly energetic, uh, positive person. So, you know, you'll, you'll see me lots that will, I'll just try and I'll fail and I'll get back up and I'll do the same thing again. Uh, I'll try to encourage those around me in the studio or, or in, outside in, on, in the grass, wherever we're training. Um, and I, and that's what I love about dance and I love about improvisation is it's really allowed me to open up and, and not worry too much about what other people think. This is, uh, I'm really glad you asked as well, actually, because it's something that I very much um, share and say all the time within Relax to Erupt. And that it's, it's this idea that if I, for example, I give a very simple exercise sometimes with the, with the feet being planted on the floor and we just focus on moving the hands and, and you can focus on, you know, fingertips, uh, fists can be clenched, you can look with a finger, it can be anything you want, but just don't care what you look like, you know, don't care, I don't care, you don't care, I just move for the sake of moving, but with this short, uh, not short, this very clear uh, uh, structure in place. Um, so you know the boundaries, you know you can't move your feet, you know you can't, yeah, you can't move your feet, you have to stay planted, but you can move the torso. I didn't say anything about the hips, the knees, the ankles, the, you know, as long as the feet are still there, then we're looking for that plasticity in the rest of the body. Um, and, and yeah, this is a big part of the way I move. When I'm in the studio now, I, as I said, mentioned earlier on, I'm, I'm confident enough in my body that what will come through will, will come through. And, you know, I don't need to worry about going in and, and creating something which is of, of a great magnitude for the people that are viewing it, you know, because also there's such beauty in, in the subtlety and the, and the silence within a body also, um, as well as, all the other things you might see sometimes on my social media. Um, so yeah, this is a this is a, a a big thing a part of my practice. And I, I guess just going back to your question, it it, it just changes the, the moods and the states I'm in. And I think now I'm in a place where it's okay to just allow that to happen. Also, sometimes it can happen because of you know something not going right and I guess this relates a little bit more back to my more meditation and I did a course in in mindfulness uh for the Oxford Mindfulness Center and again you know meditation also has allowed me to sort of get a little bit more in tune with my body or when I have this urge for something to come and I can choose to say yes to it or I can choose to fight it you know but now I I, I feel it a little bit more before it comes so then I feel like I have a what I'm trying to do each day when I do my meditations or when I, you know, when I move movement is my meditation most days, then I'm, I'm creating this gap that just allows me to just have a little bit more time before I can act on something, not necessarily react to it. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, was I right though? Didn't you have a performance where you were, you were kind of, trying to say something around yeah that. so I, I feel like whenever I create actually it's it's based around mental health um why is that such a key theme for you yeah uh it's it's a good question and it's something that now I haven't necessarily choreographed in a, in in a in a while I suppose because of the covid and lockdown but it was always a, it was always a factor for me and, and that first one that you point out was a solo I created around schizophrenia 
okay, and I found it was. fascinating, you know, how, how, how you can be in this body and, and be someone totally different. Uh, I think also it was part, partly based on, you know, fiction and nonfiction. Um, I, I, I know it's a very sensitive topic for some people because also it can be within their lives. So I didn't want to not do it justice. So I checked out some research in terms of things that happen and go on in the brain. Um, and then also I was very much inspired actually from a movie which I can't remember the name of. I think it was called, no, Glass is like the prequel, but there was one after it. Uh, it's got James uh, McAvoy in it. Um, can't remember it, but it, again, it was about him having 38 personalities mm -hmm. within this one body. And the way he embodied like this, sometimes this feminine quality when he decided to be a woman, when he was this playful kid, when he was a baby, and it and it's it just fascinated me, you know. But just from the simple, subtle shift of how one would look with the eyes, or how the chin would go down, and how that gives off a different image straight away. How the the chest is up really shows that confidence, uh, or maybe arrogance. And there's these tiny subtleties within the body, and it and it resonates so much. Um, so to me, I guess that's where, that's why I sort of created that solo. Um, I also know that back then it's all, and still now, you know, it's not something that we feel so comfortable to talk about. And, and I know how important it is to actually, you know, be in the right hands and speak with the right people about these things. Um, so to me, it was also trying to advocate this sort of vulnerability because it was very vulnerable to do a solo on stage in front of everyone where some nights I wasn't too sure what the, the, the plan was. There was a moment in it, which was, improvisation and again what happened there changed every time and sometimes I didn't like it but that's what happened and that that's what I did so it was it was a, a really fascinating show and it's definitely something I'll go back to and spend more time in but I also then once I finished that I also wanted a break from that because it was also you know it was very physically demanding because that's how I move but also very emotionally um uh yeah yeah wow that's great um, yeah, I mean, I was just talking uh, the other day with a friend of mine who <laughs> there's probably zillions of people in the world like this, and just, you know, uh, from parenting to finances to like 20 different life questions, right, that were not simple all at the same time. And we were talking about sleep, you know, and do you get enough sleep? And if you think about the person who doesn't sleep, it's like what's going on in the body as you toss and turn and you, um, and so, I mean, in my own personal story, like I, I definitely had a period of time where I was not so happy and sleep was definitely part of it. And I could feel it in bed at night. It was just like, my body is not quite my own in the way I want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then the kind of movement I, I see you doing, and I, I can only imagine you must have, among all the things you've done, you probably, uh, been a bit in the world of contact improvisation, I would imagine I see you doing that. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm excited because uh, this Sunday, for the first time in over a year, there's going to be a contact jam here that I can go oh, to. Amazing, amazing. That point. Yeah, so happy. But, um, you know, this, this way of moving, because contact improvisation, it's also a scenario where, like what you said in your workshops, the idea is it might be nice to see, but that's not the point. The point is how does it feel and how do you kind of express through sensation more than appearance? Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it strikes me that, or and, and also with the film you mentioned, the, the guy who's one of his, his, his personalities is womanly, right? Mm -hmm. But how many guys wanna walk down the street with an appearance of being womanly? I mean, some, some people are fine with that, right? And we're in a world where that's being more openly explored all these kinds of questions. But then again, if I feel good in my body being womanly, but I don't feel good being seen as womanly, it's like, it's a conflict that's in my body as well as in my psyche. And um, so, so the, maybe coming back to the practice of relax to erupt, I also, what I hear in that title is like a relaxation where it's like, I can do almost anything, but then there's, sometimes I have these impulses of just like 
almost explosive impulses, which is also a thing that like, generally speaking, walking on the street, I should probably contain that, right? I probably shouldn't move mm -hmm. explosively through space. I might frighten someone, but it seems like you're kind of allowing uh, people to really explore that range. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is actually, yeah, this is the, uh, the, the why as to why I created, or sorry, titled it Relax to Erupt, you know, is because one, it, ha it can be seen as very vague, you know, what is Relax to Erupt, so, you know, I, I don't know what that is. And I love the fact that people can't associate with that straight away. Um, I think that also then draws a certain... Yeah, I think so. the way you word things also does draw a certain crowd. So if I called it a dance class, then I know lots of other people that you know are fascinated in movement and perhaps have the same capability to do it would not join because they'd assume it's a dance class and they didn't do dance. Um, I also didn't call it a this class because of that and that and that. So that's why it's just called Relax to Erupt because that, I think anyone's a bit like, okay, so what is it? And then they can, uh, they, most people are curious as to what, what else, what comes with the title of Relax to Erupt and who's it for? And then that's when I can say, well, it's up to you to decide, but I'll tell you what I think. Um, yeah, uh, and then also the second thing is that it allows me to evolve and adapt as a practice. You know, Relax to Erupt isn't something set in stone. So people don't, yeah, it's not set here. I can constantly keep evolving so like I mentioned earlier on it could then perhaps just be something that's so totally boxing orientated in five years time because that's where I've been studying hardcore and perhaps that's just a big interest of mine and and who knows what the future is to bring mm -hmm. um and this is a fundamental within relax to erupt mm -hmm. well it does seem like um you know kind of breaking out of the the strict definitions of different uh, categories is is that's kind of where innovation comes from, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if I think of you know jazz, Charlie Parker when he came along, the way he played the saxophone at first for a lot of people it was like, "What are you doing? You're not. This is just you don't use those rhythms. You don't play those notes on those chords." But he was like, "Well, I do," and you know, <laughs> he developed something, or. Um, Maybe a little closer to your world. I'm, I'm thinking of, um, you know, another big figure in, in, and I think he coined the phrase movement culture is Ido Portal. But one of the famous things he did was he worked with this fighter, Conor McGregor. And a lot of what he's doing with Conor McGregor is clearly not standard fighting training. Yes. So, you know, and there, that was, I mean, I, that was a thing for a while. Um, but it's but also. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. There's also something that I love, and I believe it came from Ido Portal. Uh, also, you know, who knows where also it comes from, but I, I believe I heard it there first. And he and he states that um, which way is it? He goes, complex tools, uh, simple body, and complex body, simple tools. So you know, the idea of the ring. It's a very simple tool. However, the benefits it can have within your shoulder, within your back, within your within your whole body and your whole structure is 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 endless almost there's so much play there but when you go to the gym and you use this specific pull down machine which can only be pulled down this way and it only has that benefit then this is all it's building so the more complex the tools are in some way the, the less beneficial they are for the body and for the intelligence a simple stick is such an amazing tool you know to train with with someone and and what you can find with having that simple tool and having a complex body is 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 exactly what we're after we're after having this body which is adaptable and can thrive in many environments rather than just within one specific environment because we train it with one specific tool well one of the things that uh you mentioned in the description of relax corrupt that that relates this question of adaptation is you said uh, somewhere that when moving to the floor, you say we're actually looking for the parts of the body that are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So is that mm -hmm. is that just so we can kind of like figure out why that's the case and then eliminate? Yeah, the I mean, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it it kind of is, you know, to some degree. Uh -huh. We're looking for areas which bring discomfort and and in in 
hopefully you know i create that environment and that atmosphere which allows us to to do that you know um i think there's no better way than doing it unless you're in that class in that workshop setting which is why i try to create uh create the setting to be so uh, so free within some extent you know that we really just have this okay why not if not now then when am i going to do it um and that's what's helped me to create the the body and the, the moves that i can is because i've gone okay well i can do that now so what's next if i'm sticking to my my rule of 60 to 40 percent 70 to 30 percent you know success to failure then what's next i could stay here and it could it could be great and i could really master this thing but then i'd be missing out on so many other uh tools or, or ways of moving um and i think that's what i also love about kids and and and, and children you know is just this i find it so fascinating my um I now have a nephew, he's like a year and a half old and every couple of six weeks, a month, however long it is when I'm away, when I come back and when I see him again, I'm like, but what? You've now taught yourself how to use your hand properly, you know, without even talking. You've now taught yourself how to squat and then to stand up and now to run around. You're running on your toes for so long. And now you've understood, actually, if I have my heels on the floor, I can pivot a bit more and I can turn. And this isn't from a like a, a talking standpoint. This is from doing and trying and, and right. really trying to find out what is the most beneficial way of moving. So then I feel like we get to this point that we've reached that and we found that. And we stop with that. I mean, yeah, if I was walking down the street, the most beneficial way is to walk, not to go on my hands. But it's here and it's a possibility. The same as using my arms when I fall. You know, if I fall, I'm not always in the perfect world. And I think this is where lots of injuries comes in for dancers. Um, is that when things go wrong, we're not used to at all being in that place of vulnerability. We're used to always tracking the knees over toes, knees over toes, because that is the that is the healthiest, safest way. But if my knees have never gone on the outside, if they've never fallen in, then when that happens, already it's too late. I don't have the comfort, I don't have the strength there in order to have this sort of plasticity in, in my joints, in my muscles. Um, so yeah, this is something we look at a lot uh, with it within the practice, and which is why I make such a, a clear point within classes that I will demonstrate lots, and hopefully people will see me fall. You know, sometimes it could be a great improv, and I'd be like, "Wow, that was a lot of risk there, but lots of reward." And other times it can be a lot of risk, and I will just flop, and I will just land on my bum, or I will just land on my back, and and I th I think that's what. I, I've learned a lot from being inspired by many great teachers, such as Sade and Christina Eleni. They have a Eleni dance. They used to be athletes. And just before they were about to sort of hit the pinnacle, let's say, career of being athletes, they then decided to be dancers. And they just took that massive risk and they couldn't even touch their toes to start because their, their legs were so muscle bound and they're designed for athletics. They weren't, well, not designed, but they built their bodies in a way which is ready for athletics. Right. right. And now you see them, you know, they're just incredible, inspiring athletes. And that was driven from passion, uh, dancers as well as, let's say, movers. And that was driven from their own passion and their own curiosity and having that sort of, again, intrinsic motivation. You know, it was led from them. They were motivated for their own personal beliefs. Um, yeah, I, yeah, if I... I find movement fascinating you know <laughs> it's like what what more is there to say at one at some points I'm like okay great I'm really I'm really good in the air at the moment and, and changing mid-direction however now I, I'm starting to slack a lot with I can I, I don't know I feel like my legs are taking a, a battering let's say so then okay then how do I change you know over the next course the next few weeks how then do I change my training if I'm coming up to a rehearsal period where I know I'm a lot on, let's say, concrete or something where it's outdoor touring, then what do I need to do in my spare time? Perhaps it's actually less training and it's more about my rehabilitation and how I look after myself ready for those weeks. And I think beforehand, it's quite funny when I think back to it now. But when I first started to try to define my own daily practice and the daily do, I was doing HIIT workouts and I was doing high intensity interval training 
every single day of the week. It was like I never had a day off. So of course, this has had benefits in the terms of like my agility and how I spring from the floor and up to, the, uh, you know, jump up and my height and, and different things like this. However, if I'd have done that every day, then I miss the length in the, my body. You know, I miss training other areas. It can't always be a press up. It can't always be a squat, a lunge, you know, how my, my hips need to move elsewhere and they need to rotate and have this inversion and this extension. Um, so it's funny now when I look back, but actually I'm so grateful that I did that solidly for like a year because then I, I started to then go, oh yeah, but now I've done this so much. I can't do this. So at the moment, my, my, my training involves, I mean, well, before lockdown, it was a little bit more climbing again. And how do I get into climbing and, and pushing through my legs and using my arms? Um, I started to notice I was, a, I was getting a bit too bulky again for this specific work that I was doing. So then I had to rest off that and go into a little bit more yoga and a little bit of more of my own relaxed to erupt training, trying to get rid of associated tension. Um, and it's just constantly changing. And I think that is what's so important about a practice. It, it has to have that adaptability. When I was injured, uh, it then ended up being a um, uh, an L4, L5 sort of disc, uh, prolapse sort of disc. Um, so then it meant I was out for, let's say, minimum six to eight weeks. Uh, so then my training changed massively. It then changed to just exercises for my back, 30 minutes a day. And then from then on, reading and then doing this and then doing that and sitting in the squat position rather than acti actively, you know, actively training, let's say, you know, it was more about trying to see my movement throughout the whole day. Uh, rather than just a quick little hour here or an hour there or two hours here and how I can sort of maintain this lifestyle um, knowing that I'm not quite at where I like to be. Uh, it was something that was shared with me again with um, Thomas Lav English uh, when I first met him a part of the collective um, and, he, and he was asking people in the group, you know, like, uh, yes, great. We go to the hour, we do training at the gym, you know, we work hard, individual muscles or whatever. But then we sit down for eight hours in a chair, working away for the rest of the day. And he was like, just think, like, what are you actually training your body to do? Are you training your body to do the hour? Or are you training your body to do the eight hours in this other place? And I've never thought about it like that before, but it, 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 of course, you know, that, that, that's what your body's going to get used to quicker than that, because you're spending so much time in that position compared to the other place. Um, so that's where it started to become a little bit more of a lifestyle for me and something that I try to translate in what I do in my daily practice or my daily do's, you know, how do you reach for that? How do I bend down to get that? How do I, shift this object you know like really simple things but actually they make such a big difference in 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 the in the long run in the long scale yeah um you mentioned a couple of things in there um about yeah just just how how does the movement practice serve us in life not just in the practice itself but um you know one, one of the things that struck me you talk about if you know you're going to be on concrete, right? And so that's that's the question of the environment. Um, in my own, you know, kind of explorations, I had a had maybe a six months of doing parkour, which unfortunately ended with me kind of. I think I cracked my ribs, although I never oh. had them looked at. But I I fell and I went across a bar like this, and it was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that for a while. But while I was doing it, one of the things that I noticed when I was just walking around my neighborhood. The neighborhood looked different because it was like, could I climb that wall? Maybe, you know, and oh, well, not that one, or that, that doesn't look stable enough to hold my weight that over there. But it was like, you know, the way I saw things changed. Um, so anyway, you might have something to say about that, but actually I'm going to jump again because uh, one of the things I wanted to get to and, and I see it in, in, inside of this question of how we relate to the environment, but more particularly is our relationships to others. Because another thing I see you doing often, um, for example, you've got a couple of buddies, Winston Reynolds and Samuel Caleb, and 
but 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 also in the workshops with your participants there's often um just you're making use of another person to either create situations or to give support to the body in different ways. So um, there's there's a really interesting kind of movement dialogue you're often doing. Mm -hmm. So just to learn more about that. Yeah, I think you know there's there's things you can't do even though an independent practice is so fundamental. So you're not relying on anyone, you know, and you can still have that challenge, you know. And the risk factors but i think as soon as you bring another body into play you then have to there's the the bubble of what you thought you knew is just doubled you know because then actually now all my habits that i know i'm i'm used to and i'm good at this person could do the total opposite or again he can challenge me so then it, it's an amazing way to train with a partner to break down your own habits um uh going also from that and what you what you said at the beginning about how you saw the outside world my my friend Winston Reynolds is currently doing a I think it's a 12-week program um, which is essentially based around parkour it's not just parkour but there's lots of parkour training within it because of the the person that's created it I can't remember his name um, but yeah my friend Winston's bought this program and, and now every time I speak of him he's like yeah I'm doing rail training at the moment I'm doing jump training I'm doing grid work where he just gets some tape and puts it on the floor where he's, he's climbing up walls he's and he's doing all these different things and he's and I remember him telling me them exact words that now the way he sees his the world around him and his environment has changed massively he sees this wall and goes that could be a good wall to train or that that rail that could be a good and I and it makes me laugh you know when I walk with him anywhere we see these things because it's it's so true and I, and I love the work and, and that's just proof that it doesn't matter what space you have, um, you can train anywhere, you know, and I, I think that's also what I'm trying to dig out of myself now. Now I'm in lockdown, you know, while I, I'm, I'm just in a not lockdown, but I'm in a quarantine here because um, I came back from another country back to England. So now I only have my house or my garden, you know, I can't, I'm not allowed to leave anywhere else. So I can't go on a long run in my garden. I'm in my garden. So what is it then I have to find, you know, in my garden to train? If it's raining, does that then mean I can't train? Does that then mean I have to come inside? Or perhaps I I, I, I get used to that and I see what difference that makes on my feet when I turn and how it tears up the floor and how it's more slippery, you know. Mm -hmm. Again, evolving back to this idea of being adaptable. Um, but yeah, this is something that's very inspiring with them too. And they're very, very close friends of mine, Samuel, Caleb Baxter and Winston Reynolds. You know, they're, they're, we're constantly looking to add more complexity to the situation. However, we're also not afraid of basics, you know, and, and we never just steer away from them and just think, okay, let's keep going crazy and crazy. We still like a, an improv. We still like a training session with something that we've done but how do we get that time a little bit faster? Or perhaps how do we work on really the minute details of how slow we can be? Um, it kind of sounds all up in the air. It sounds like I'm saying everything, but that's that's the that's the approach and that's the way we try to view it, you know, that we really, we, we don't say no to anything, you know, it is the idea. Now, again, it depends on your body type and how much time you train there. Um, and how many hours you put in depending on what that then will look like on your own body mm -hmm. um winston has a circus background my friend sam actually has a cheerleading background me technically i've never done any gymnastics um but maybe from watching my videos and it makes me laugh and sometimes you know people comment or they say like oh do i have to be a, a gymnastic level to, to come to your class i'm like no <laughs> i say to them no because I don't have that so if you had that technically you're better than me you know like with the when it comes to a qualification or things like that but um it's not about that sort of level with me it's just about that right. openness and approach um right. and it's something that I love to sort of share within these three but also I guess the, the cohort the collective and anyone that comes to the class um is that we we, we, we maintain being the student and, and we keep reaching and failing <laughs> yeah well i mean i 
for me, this question of the environment or relating to other people, again, it's part of how we connect it broader, but even just in terms of movement, um, there, there's a way that you're mapping space, right? Like if I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm not really clear on how many feet the wall is over there, then my movements in that direction are not gonna be as clear, even if my body and my joints are in good shape, right? If I, I don't know how much space I have, um, but it, it, it seems like it, the, the other thing I think of in terms of like, um, you know, the, the person you're working with who does something unpredictable, um, just drawing again on my own experience, I used to work uh, in industry quite a lot. And uh, I was working in meat processing plants um, here in the US in a few different places. And there'd be, you know, there'd be a lot of work and it needed to get done by a certain amount of time. And, you know, people are working at machines, there's knives, there's all kinds of things, but then there's everyone else who has their thing and everyone is moving in every direction with heavy, you know, objects, pushing carts, sharp knives, all these kinds of things. And you just had to, I think I developed a lot of spatial awareness yeah. by necessity in this situation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the fun thing was, uh, I'm thinking of what you've mentioned a few times about vulnerability, because there was also a certain point where, while I knew that there was dangers in the environment, when I got really comfortable, I could almost dance while I worked. I could almost still be comfortable despite, just because I knew I'm not going to throw myself sort of in a, in a mindless way without knowing where I'm going, because I'm always tracking. It became a kind of a, just a thing that I was doing, yeah. Tracking as I as I move. Because then you get to it, it's gotten to that stage where it's so comfortable, it's now habitual. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've read many great sort of books and 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 specialists within their field and that and how they break these things down is is fascinating. You know, sort of the the stages of learning and and. And how if we just maintain this comfort, then we just we we just get stuck, you know. We think there's not really any point reaching that that maximum. And I think the great thing is that within athletes or within those that are high up with amongst their fields, let's say, I think they're very aware of that and they know that let's say greatness has no potential if you're aiming for a specific thing um however the the more norm and those that work in without that they i think the way it's shared to them sadly just has this view of this is good this is wrong uh you need to do it like this or it needs to look like this and actually if everyone just had more of an openness to to, to, to movement and you did it again like i keep saying but for your own personal reasons then we'd all be a lot more happier, you know, and we'd all be a lot more healthier, but, and we'd have a, and I don't, and I mean healthier, I mean by a healthier outlook on that, you know, I don't mean just healthier within the body. I mean, I think that just comes naturally, but it, it came when I started to look at movement differently. And when I started to then have a different approach to it and I didn't get bogged down for not being able to complete that. And there's also some things, you know, that actually your body just won't ever be able to do. I will not be any taller, I will not reach six foot. I will stay five foot five. <laughs> you know, like there's some things that I know are physically not possible. And and actually rather than seeing that as a factor which will inhibit you and then no longer can you do that, it is 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 wrong, let's say, you know. I, I guess feel like I should send you platform shoes next Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> send them in the post and the next one I'll be up high. <laughs> But yeah, and I mean, I mean, you see it within sports, let's say basketball, you know, it's a very tall sport, but there are some athletes within basketball that are still in that five foot region, but they're just, they, you know, they haven't said no to that and they've kept defining that and pushing yeah. that. Yeah. You, you, yeah, you see it in every sport, I think, you know, there, there's a, there's a bill that they say, you know, this is how it should be because that's what's only ever been done before, but there are still these other people that are proving it, proving it wrong. Um, and then that, and that's what I, that's what I love. And, and those that are open to sort of taking that approach. It, 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 it resonates a lot with me. Um, 
Well, I, I, I did assume that you were an acrobat, right? Um, mm. Or had some training, um, but that's great. But it, it, it strikes me that, um, you know, for me, if there's a sense of right or wrong in movement, I mean, the only place that I really go with that is like, well, if, if I just got hurt, that was that I did it wrong, right? Mm. But um, it strikes me when you, you can have a very open-ended idea where you're not stuck in the framework of technique. Um, it also expands the imagination, which, you know, in my way of thinking, and this is again, um, this is an idea from Feldenkrais and something that I work with often, but is the idea that every movement actually begins as an image, right? If I want to walk out the door of my apartment, I have to begin with a, an image of that pathway. I can't just do it. Like there's just no way around that I begin with the imagination. But then um, when we're talking about flipping or acrobatics, I'm thinking of one of the things I saw you do on Instagram where um, you're in a large room and you're running along and there's a moment where you're clearly, it's just like, if you were a mime, I would say, oh yes, he's, he's at a sports training and there's a bunch of rings because you do this step where it's like you're looking and step in the ring. It really looks like, like a soccer drill or something. And then you pop out of it and then you you do a flip, you do a backflip, but your your legs go up this way and it's sort of like a that kind of movement. And you come down and you land, but what struck me is like I had the sense of you saw that pathway, right? You could see it and then you totally committed to it. So maybe maybe you didn't have an acrobatic training per se, but you had an imagination where you were willing to go there and really willing to like throw your body through that pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and that just strikes me as something that um, maybe other people could do, but they stop short of imagining doing it almost. Yeah. Yeah. I th yeah, definitely. I think that leads into sort of two things that are very interlinkable. One being imagination and there's lots of actual movement that I don't even intend to do but I imagine that it could look like this and I always and I, I take the time when it comes to this moment and I'm like okay if I've done that then how do you do that it's a bit like climbing when I keep climbing that wall and I keep failing then I'm like okay what about if I imagine that my foot is there instead of here or perhaps my hat and you know and you try to see it differently and you try to piece the puzzle in a different way that will suit you um uh, or perhaps suit that end goal um so that's like the one thing with imagination. I think also the other thing that I learned with more acrobatic things or handstands is, of course, you're not just going to be able to jump from this stage to this stage because you've imagined it. It's also you need to spend time in that space to then start to build this brain map of, of what it's like to be upside down. When I go upside down, I feel quite comfortable when I'm on my hands. But again, today in the, in the garden, I was testing out a few other things and different ways of entering and when I go backwards into the hands suddenly my whole area there I'm really confused of where my legs are and I tend to drop down a lot quicker and, and I found it interesting again that I found this place that I'm used to doing but because now I enter in a different angle or in a different way suddenly it throws the whole system off um, so yeah, I, I have that imagination, but then also I know that from consistency and time within this space, I can build up a brain map in order to know what it's like to be there, you know, from going through that vulnerable, eventually you can aim to create comfortable and then you can go back to that vulnerable, but in a different level with a different understanding. Right. So imagination isn't just some sort of like whimsical fantasy about what could happen. It's also like replaying experience that like, you know, I can imagine right now putting my hand on top of my head. Why? Because I've done that so many times. I know it's not like it's, can I imagine, you know, putting my hand through the ceiling? No, because yeah. I've never done that. Although if I really decided, um, I mean, that's a silly example, but maybe to come back to the handstand, it also seems like to imagine I could do a handstand um, it might take me a year or more, but I have to begin by sort of seeing a whole pathway yeah, that, a whole that might unfold yeah. over that time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think this is often 
because of I don't know perhaps sometimes advertisement or also social media or the way things are seen I think lots of the time people just assume that you can get to that point or that you've always been able to get to that point and that's why I try to make a real big key statement on on my social media is that I'm trying to share my journey of, of where I've begun and where I am so like you said you scrolling back through and finding these different videos and, and performances and, and these different states is that I'm sharing this journey and if you go back maybe a year ago you would not see me doing some of the acrobatic things that I I could can do now however you might see me being a little bit more fluid in this and I can't do that right now you know so it, it is it's that constant change and this idea for me that my social media is is a platform for me to see my journey and it's a catalog for me to be able to go back through and, and to see the different things that I've done yeah. um, rather than just to show a finished article or a polished product mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. social media is a funny thing I mean like I told you you know because I've sort of been discovered by the algorithms already. You're the kind of person that is <laughs> bound to pop up in my feed. But of course, there's all the incredible, incredibly problematic uh, parts of social media, not just that it sucks our time, but that this constant comparison we find ourselves in. And um, yeah, again, what was refreshing to see your feed was while there's plenty of things where I could fall into a trap and say, I'm not sure I can do what Lewis just did. I, what I did see, like I said at the beginning, is, is I feel like I can see the imagination of your practice. It's like you're working on questions that are very interesting. And you're even working on things that while I might not move the way you do, I could work on that same idea, you know, wherever I'm at. And it's just a very different question than can I do a handstand, which might yeah. be part of it, but it's a very, it's just a very boxed in kind of question that like, if I get to the end, then I'll say, hey, guess what? I can do a handstand. But it's mm -hmm. kind of like that's the whole point of it. Yeah. Um, but there's a way we, we get stuck in that a bit um, in the world right now, you know, because there is this sort of, I don't know, social media is a funny place, but. Uh, <laughs> um, definitely, definitely, I agree. Well, um, what do you imagine in terms of, you know, where you're going you, you've 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 come this far you've you've what what are some things that um you're still chewing on you know like i i'm interested in putting this together and that there's some things like that that yeah um that's a good question i like i like it it's a real <laughs> nice question um for me i'm still heavily trying to see my boxing background and how I can interlink that within my movement I've started to see it more with with just how it actually I did it more recently in a, in a workshop that I taught at Tic Tac um, Art Center in Brussels uh, it's actually created by David Zambrano he invited me in okay. um, and within that workshop I started to explore a little bit more let's say more boxing techniques and fundamentals within within dance and actually that practicality and how we can use that practicality perhaps within footwork or within the twist of the torso and, and to how that can help hand speed and how we can use that in our own explorations. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm just, I'm still working on picking the boxing apart and really trying to find things from that and to put that into relax to erupt. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the, one of the, one of my biggest interests at the moment as well as as well as this world of upside down you know i'm still kind of still kind of new to it and and i find it fascinating how some people when you see them and 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 i mean my my confidence and my understanding of the world flips up that upside down has grown but some some people the way you see their control it upside down it, it's just it's fascinating for me um because it's simply they, they've just switched their world upside down and this control is just as strong as this so it's not like i have a certain goal that i want to attain in not a certain move I just want to keep exploring, you know, and right now, those are the two things that are, are a big interest of mine that I would like to 
dig a bit deeper into uh, uh, as you sort of asked yeah fantastic hmm. well i could probably think of a lot of other things to ask you but maybe that's a good <laughs> one to sort of end on um but uh could you please just tell anyone watching or listening how do they connect with you how do they find you yeah of course so um my my instagram is uh, relaxed to erupt I also have a Facebook page, which often just shares what's on my Insta, but sometimes it does share more Facebook events that will be coming up. And that is called Lewis Cook Dance. Um, uh, and I also have a website, which is sort of undergoing some work at the moment, but will be up soon. And that's lewiscook.info. Um, and that's where I share a bit more performance work as well as workshop settings. But yes, yeah, I mean, it, it, the main one I'd say is, is, the, is, the, is the social on instagram on relax to rock because then right. people get a great insight there of what the practice is and also i tend to share a lot within stories or daily updates on that one of where i'll be teaching next right well that was the other thing i was going to ask you so you're at the point or not so much you but the world is at the point where you're 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 able to be offering public workshops again in the, this year you'd be doing that yeah uh, yeah i have a few lined up i have um I'm actually teaching alongside the the, the collective, Ferris Anima Terra Nova. Um, we, uh, seven of us, I hope I haven't missed one. There's seven of us within it, uh, the core group as it stands now. And we have a two week summer intensive that's outdoors in London. Um, this summer, it's from the 26th of July till then the next week, which is the 6th of August. So it's Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday. Um, that's sort of the next bigger one I'll be doing outdoors. And then again, I go back to uh, Belgium in Brussels. I teach at Garage 29, the studio is called. And uh, this one will be a week long, 10 till 4, relax to erupt. So this will be solely me. Uh, it's changing all the time. Um, now the good news is they're not being cancelled <laughs> they seem to be running a bit more frequently yeah. which i'm happy about yeah. um so yeah we uh but yeah the best thing to do is to stay in, in contact and also just ask and ask the question i've had lots of people just say we'd love to get you out here you know um which is then what's took me sort of all over the world to do different teachings so yeah yeah well you mentioned you were once in dc or, or a, there was a dc connection that we made so yeah, I've been out love to, to have you come here too. Awesome. <laughs> exactly. I'd love to be out in DC. So, so yeah. hopefully next, next year, I'm hoping to plan again and a more American tour. So that Okay, be. well, good, good. I'll have to stay in touch with you about that. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Well, Lewis, thanks so much for the conversation. It was it was really fascinating. Um, you know, I just, I love your energy and your imagination, as I said, and, and thanks for taking the time with me. No, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Take care.